I would like to thank Dr. David Amposa for inviting me and for that great introduction. Uh, when African urban studies began several decades ago, scholars argued that colonialism did not introduce urbanization to Africa. They countered the Eurocentric conception of Ceres as exclusive preserves of Western European civilization, uh, drawing evidence from archaeology, from material culture, and even oral traditions, including the ones that praised African elites for converting wastelands and forests into built environment and series. So you hear some adorations like Obatoso Bodile, Toso Gwediburu, Tosa Atandile Oja, Otunwa Soja Ramano, the Kamerin de Lugu. Yet, colonialism introduced new patterns of urbanization to Africa, either by building on pre-existing series or creating brand new ones. And in no period in Nigeria's urban history did this become obvious than the 1950s royal visit by Queen Elizabeth II, a magnificent spectacle of imperial power that consumed an estimated two million pounds worth of Nigeria's money. Nigerians gave the queen what she came to see. You know, city civilization, urban modernity, the so-called positive gaze of a century of ruthless capitalist expropriation that manifested in tarred roads, hospitals, electricity, hygienically looking school children waving the Union Jack, a show of solidarity and loyalty, amongst other carefully created sites and symbols of imperial modernity. However, the city in Africa is more than human. Some of the biggest debates about urban planning and aesthetics of everyday life in the city have historically been shaped by humans' contradictory impression of the material as well as the symbolic values of a wide range of animal species. The dialectics of clean and dirty, ugly and beautiful, loyal and rebellious, domestic and wild animals have all been informed by how humans would like to enjoy urban modernities. From public health and pollution consideration that galvanized into slum clearance scheme, extermination of rats, and urban livestock keeping legislation, to how dog fencing defined racial and class hierarchies in urban centers, the stories of city animals should be of interest to all scholars. Europeans who criticize fellow Europeans over the shooting of beautiful and harmless birds, relied on the modernist framing of the animal as one of the beauties of urban skylines and landscape. They rarely spoke for the cat in such manner because of its ambivalent status as an animal that straddled the thin line between the tame world and the wild world. The same applied to multiple forms of animal species. So dogs remained the most beloved urban animals until the outbreak of rabies, when a single legislation known as the Dogs Ordinance placed their survivor in the hands of instant death. The central argument of this lecture is that animals have escaped the purview of urban study scholars because of the anthropocentric or the humanocentric or the human-centered conception of history and of agency. And in order to address this epistemological deficiency, we need to rethink the circumstances under which animals can be object, subject, and agent of historical interpretation. It is a truism that animals did not write about themselves in the past. They didn't. However, they took independent actions that formed the basis of major turning points in human history. And this itself represents a form of agency that scholars should not overlook. 
So one of the things I'm going to try to do today, <coughs> essentially, is to use the story of urban dogs to engage with the intersections of animality and urbanity. And the reason I'm using the story of dogs can be best understood within the context of transcultural <laughs> understanding of the place of dogs in human history. We all know that across cultures, dogs are historically humans most intimate friends or companions. And for many reasons that I will try to explain from the perspective of the experience of Lagos today, animals were also one of the signals of urbanity. They were the most beloved urban animals. People just love them because they are urban animals. The territorial consciousness of dogs actually worked very well with the concept of urbanity and urban planning. 